If you've listened to this podcast at all, you know that I like to keep my finger on the pulse of men experiencing internet renaissances. If you've never listened to this podcast and this is your first episode, welcome! Uh, Weird entry point, but I appreciate it. (laughs) Uh, To explain, the internet periodically falls in love with male actors and holds them up as, like, shining examples of a good celebrity. Someone who has stayed in their lane and said nice things and generally given you no major reasons to hate them. Everyone stares at them for a bit, shares some good memories, and then moves on to the next little man they believe won't hurt their feelings. And as someone who is actively working to avoid having their feelings hurt by men at all times, I like to keep tabs on who the flavor of the month is. And at the moment, it's Robert Pattinson. It's been building for a while, I think maybe since the DVD commentary for the Twilight series came out and it became extremely apparent that Robert Pattinson is like a little bit skeptical of the series that effectively launched his career. But in a post-COVID-19 world, this has really been solidified by the GQ article that came out at the height of the lockdown in which Pattinson attempts to invent a pasta, uh, almost burns his house down, explains that he struggles with even the most basic concepts of time, and then complains about the fact that the producers for Batman want him to work out a bunch. The article itself is a riot and is accompanied by photos of Pattinson that he took himself in isolation that make him look at best like a man haunted by a Victorian ghost child, and more often like a man who tried to sell me speed at a party one time. I think the general vibe of the world currently is that we're all so sort of exhausted by like capitalism and a pandemic that we automatically like anyone willing to admit that being a tool of capitalism via the contemporary drug market sucks, even if it's paying you a lot of money. And Robert Pattinson has been more than willing to do that on more than one occasion, particularly with the large blockbusters he's been involved in. But in between all of that, he's made some truly weird indie films. So I thought today we could spend some time thinking about the trajectory from teen heartthrob to talented weirdo. I'm Alex, this is Pop Culture Burner, the podcast edition, and today I'm thinking about whatever the hell Robert Pattinson is up to. Okay, so I do want to spend most of this episode on Pattinson because the more I look at him do things, the more I'm convinced that he's like a secret genius who's sort of, I don't know, distracting us from said genius qualities by giving extremely weird interviews and showing up in photos with Death Grips and Beyonce. But I also want to think about the phenomenon of the teen heartthrob. Pattinson's career was launched by two of the biggest film franchises in the world. He was just 19 when he played the doomed Cedric Diggory in the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire movie, and 22 when he was cast as Edward Cullen in the Twilight series, which went on to gross $3.3 billion globally. His early career was essentially defined by his status as an object of desire for teen girls the world over, who all wanted to find their very own real-life sparkly vampire boyfriend. Achieving this type of success at a young age can really break a person, or at least, like, set them up for future failure. Look at almost any man who got famous as, like, a kind of teen centerfold. Uh, Johnny Depp comes to mind. He goes from young and hot and talented to, like, old and a bit sad and making the same franchise movie over and over again. Or, you know, their increasingly alarming and or tragic personal lives overtake whatever they're doing professionally. But there are a few people that seem to be able to tread the line to like keep themselves in check and ultimately channel some of that success into like a really solid career. So in this episode, I thought we could take a look at what it takes to make an enduring career out of being a teen heartthrob, what it takes to successfully dismantle that status, and how Robert Pattinson embodies that trajectory with his own weird flourishes. Before we get into it, to understand the context of this episode, I want you to close your eyes and picture me. Now, if you don't know what I look like, uh, thanks for being one of the four listeners who aren't my close personal friends. Uh, Your prizes are in the mail, and you can find my face on the website. I'll give you a second. Okay, uh, now back to this guided meditation component. Close your eyes and picture me in a tranquil, windowless room, surrounded by thousands of pieces 
of paper, just very small pieces of paper. The silence is going to be periodically broken by me screeching in triumph and linking the tiny pieces of paper together with string until they form a complex and impenetrable web and I become trapped in the room. This is the usual process for me writing an episode, but it really intensifies whenever I come up with a stupid theory, like whether or not the rock smooches people. He does not. Or uh, if there is a complex multi-generational relationship between all English boy bands. There is. <clears throat> so, this week, allow me to introduce you to my new piece of pop cultural theory, the teen heartthrob trajectory, or the THT. Now, partial credit for this theory goes to my friend Jamie, who you may remember from his Gordon Ramsay fixation in episode 6. Jamie called me recently after he watched the film Tenet, uh, which features Pattinson in a leading role. Mostly he was calling to yell the phrase, you never go full Nolan, uh, to me, which is true, but also beside the point for this episode. Uh, He raised an interesting secondary point, which was that the potential correlation between Robert Pattinson's ongoing credibility as an actor and his penchant over the past, like, decade or so for choosing more obscure independent roles rather than trying to continue in a blockbuster romance vein. He also suggested that this correlation was responsible for the salvation of several careers, including Daniel Radcliffe's. Now, This perfectly reasonable idea is where I started, but then I went full goblin, and I've ended up with the teen heartthrob trajectory. Now, the THT is less of like a straight line, and more of like a choose-your-own-adventure pathway that branches off into a new set of outcomes with each choice made. The name is slightly misleading, in that the trajectory can also start earlier in kind of like child stardom territory, But the acronym was getting too long, so in the interests of brevity and, like, I don't know, slowing my own roll, we've gone with THT. The point of the THT is to successfully navigate from normal citizen to possibly talented, mostly handsome centerpiece in a large franchise or Hollywood blockbuster to critically acclaimed star and potential secret genius. It's not a game everyone wins. I for example, have failed at the first hurdle in that I have yet to make it past normal citizen. Uh, Every opportunity taken by those on the THT has a set of consequences that either moves them closer towards the eventual status of beautiful genius or closer toward the eventual fourth place run on Dancing with the Stars. It's a set of parallel paths with infinite branches and endgames that are ultimately a variation on a theme. Before we circle back to Pattinson, allow me to illustrate the trajectory with a classic Hollywood example. Let's use James Dean. After kicking about as an uncredited actor in commercials, James Dean passes the first hurdle by being cast as an outsider in East of Eden. It's a big Hollywood production with a big name director attached. Project finished, Dean chooses to immediately follow it up with Rebel Without a Cause which is released in the same year and in which he plays a similarly kind of outcast character. But being a 20-something-year-old with appetites, hedonism abides, and aside from the crabs that he allegedly contracts while cruising, quote Kenneth Anger on that one, not me, uh, he develops a need for speed, which ultimately ends his life on the 30th of September, 1955. His lionization as beautiful genius comes sadly posthumously, which is arguably like a worse option than fading into tragic caricature of yourself. But, you know, swings and roundabouts. Or like, you know, a series of choices leading up to an inevitable end, depending on how you look at it. So now you sort of get what I'm on about. Sort of. (laughs) We're bringing it back to Pattinson. Ultimately, the first and biggest hurdle on the THT is not necessarily a choice made by the actor themselves, but like a small twist of fate. Let's put Pattinson alongside someone like Daniel Radcliffe, since I've already kind of mentioned him. Now, the clearing of the first hurdle for these two is pretty similar. They're given life-altering leading roles in pieces of media that essentially defined their cultural moment. This decision is beyond their control, but it does set their playing fields at slightly different levels. 
The key difference is that Daniel Radcliffe is cast in Harry Potter because he is a child, and Robert Pattinson is cast in Twilight because he could be sexy. Any elevation of Radcliffe to teen heartthrob status at this point is an accidental byproduct of this first decision. A preteen audience who grows into adolescence with a character who finally has a living, breathing incarnation. Pattinson is set as something the teens and tweens are already lusting after. Both of them are now presented with a choice. They can attempt to replicate their previous success by taking similar roles, or they can do something different. Both of them go the something different route. Radcliffe takes a role in the stage production of Equus, which requires him to be nude and in the vicinity of a horse. Pattinson takes a role as Salvador Dali, trying desperately to bone Federico Garcia Lorca in Little Ashes. This is done in between Twilight installments. Both are weird choices, and this becomes a pattern. Both Radcliffe and Pattinson continuously take strange roles in independent films, or roles with critically acclaimed art house directors, or roles that just generally dismantle the wholesome-ish image that comes with being a leading man in a film series directed at young adults. So if it's only indie films that can save you, surely everyone should be fine, right? You can just choose some obscure roles, maybe play gay a couple of times, or like grow a mustache or something, get paid peanuts for a few roles because you can afford it. Well, look, it's not, unfortunately, not quite as simple as that. Uh, Let's look at an American counterpart. Let's look at Shia LaBeouf, actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf. Now, Shia has been on the THT for much longer than either Radcliffe or Pattinson, having started acting as a tiny child in the late 90s. And there have been several attempts to launch him to the status of go-to leading man via the medium of mega franchise like Transformers, or the very regrettable fourth Indiana Jones movie that I will not get into lest I become extremely irritated. (laughs) Uh, They haven't really worked out, and Shia's attempts to be taken seriously have been more like desperate swings and misses than they have hits. He's attempted to go full method by repeatedly getting tattooed for roles, but tragically these roles haven't actually been any good. The tax collector did not need the commitment of a full chess piece, dude. And in between all of these attempts have been some increasingly bizarre side plots in his personal life. Like that time he ripped off Ghost War writer Dan Clow's word for word and then claimed it was a commentary on plagiarism. And then doubled down by doing it again. And then doing it again with a literal Bukowski poem. (laughs) Despite obviously wanting to clear the final hurdle into beautiful genius territory, Shia is simply unable to do so. Too many wrong choices on the THT. Method acting, uh, mainly. That'll really, really throw you off. On the other hand, both Radcliffe and Pattinson have managed to remain relatively controversy-free. The focus has never really been on their personal life, but rather on their craft, Uh, except for that time Rob got cheated on by Kristen Stewart, who is an obvious lesbian. (laughs) But mostly they show up, they do their job, and then they leave. Now, this is obviously extremely important. Like, if I were any good at math, there would be some significant influential factor that we would assign to personal lives when plotting the THT formula. But tragically, I only got 20% in the only algebra test that I ever took, and I'm pretty sure that that 20% was just because the math teacher had other stuff going on. Uh, I was great at English, though, so instead of like a proper mathematic formula, you get uh, a podcast and vague gesturing. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) I digress. While it's really obviously important, personal lives uh, cannot be the only defining factor. Despite being a well-respected actor and pretty drama-free, Daniel Radcliffe is hardly considered like a virtuoso of the silver screen, you know? No one's claiming Daniel Radcliffe has a deep and profound understanding of the human condition because he made the woman in black. He might have successfully navigated his way past teen heartthrob, but now he's more in the territory of a very nice man who didn't ruin his own life despite early exposure to the limelight. Which is a nice category to be in, but it's not end game. you know? It's not the same. You're not a beautiful genius. So what is it about Pattinson then? Why am I hunched over endless rewatches of Twilight and connecting them 
to like bizarre mermaid fucking performances in the lighthouse and screeching, by God, he's done it, at anyone who gets too close to me. Uh, A lot of reasons. Tendency to hyperfixate, largely. Uh, But also some other things. Specifically that I think he's extremely in tune with both the roles he's doing and the objective silliness of having to talk about your job all the time. Let's, like, talk about the GQ article by Zach Barron because I think it goes some way to explaining part of Pattinson's graceful leap into beautiful genius. And I want to pull some quotes from it so it might be nice to have context for you. The article came out in May, uh, but it was written early in April, which means that it came out around the peak of the COVID lockdown in a lot of places. The opening five words are Robert Pattinson, blurry, pixelated, unshaven, which is a huge mood. (laughs) It's really tempting to get sidetracked by the fact that Pattinson explodes a microwave over the course of the interview while attempting to invent a handheld pasta. Like, really tempting. Because it's delightful, and I think it goes some way to explaining part of his overall charm. But disappointingly, he also says some stuff about acting, so we're not going to focus on the pasta explosion or the weird mirror selfies. One of the things that actually really caught my eye about the interview was the fact that Pattinson referred to the Twilight series as things that seem more sort of like existential art house movies than things that were intentionally that. Now, a lot of actors on the THT who are trying to be taken seriously will renounce their original franchise as something that gave them the freedom to explore real acting or whatever. This is usually said while promoting something that is objectively terrible. (laughs) So for Pattinson to not do that is quite odd. But for him to not only not do that, but also confirm that in some ways Twilight kind of aligns with his own tastes is actually kind of extraordinary. More extraordinary, I think, is that he's kind of right. <laughs> Have you rewatched the first Twilight movie recently? Like, so, so many things happen. So many choices are made. <laughs> Robert Pattinson somehow seems to have, like, a really strong grip on the character. The story is sort of essentially like a Mormon adolescent sex fantasy that's made into a global hit. But here's Robert Pattinson as a sparkly vampire guy just going ham. There's something specifically about Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart's performances in Twilight that actually just really sets the whole thing on like a fundamentally different level from any young adult franchise before or since. They somehow actually managed to capture the full ludicrousness of the setup without ever coming off as mocking. And plus, they actually look like they want to kind of bone each other, which is cool. And then he goes from that to making The Lighthouse, which is a deeply chaotic art house flick where he has homoerotic tension with Willem Dafoe and fucks a mermaid and is disemboweled graphically by seagulls. Imagine being someone who was into Pattinson as a teen and going, I think I'll check out this movie starring my childhood crush, Robert Pattinson, and critically acclaimed actor, Willem Dafoe. I sure hope it's nice. And, like, it's not nice. It's a bloody good movie, though, and he's really good in it. (laughs) But for the life of him, Pattinson cannot seem to say anything about the actual films that he's promoting. Like, at the time of the GQ interview, he's supposed to be promoting Tenet. The interview goes off the rails so many times. The pasta explosion is just one pretty large part of it. But they only end up mentioning Tennant twice before moving on to other things. And one of those times is just to mention that Robert Pattinson hasn't seen the film. I think the trap that a lot of teen heartthrobs fall into is this need to endlessly explain their craft to prove that they're not just, like, a pretty face, but that they, like, understand something the rest of us don't about acting. And, like, I think Pattinson does. I think he's really smart in almost every role that he does, but he couldn't fathom telling anyone about it, which is great, because I don't care. (laughs) 
There's absolutely nothing worse than someone who takes themselves extremely seriously trying to explain to you why you should also take them extremely seriously. (laughs) Anyway, what I'm saying is I think Robert Pattinson has managed to successfully navigate the THT, that's the teen heartthrob trajectory, because he has at all points been extremely aware of what he's doing, but unpretentious about it. When pressed to give context, any context, please God, he won't do it. He either says something completely ludicrous or gives a little scrap of information before quickly flitting on to the next topic. He's not looking back with wild regret at the things that made him, and he's not looking forward in a way where he's desperately trying to continue on a serious path. He's just started to take major blockbusters again, because he wants to, and that's delightful. That's beautiful genius territory. All right. Well, uh, there's my there's my Pattinson monologue. Uh, has anyone has anyone else seen The Lighthouse? Someone? Anyone? I'm still reeling. I watched it during my like 9 p.m. Sunday depression. Uh, and I need you to talk to me about mermaid vaginas. Mer- merginas. <laughs> I've dubbed them. And like one-eyed seagulls. Uh, and what it all means. Next time you see me at the pub. <laughs> Please. Peace. Peace.